Well, so glad to have each one of you here today. Um, several weeks ago, I mentioned that uh, I'd like to invite people who have entered into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'd like to have an opportunity for you to be water baptized. And there may also be some people that are here or maybe aren't here this morning and are listening to this broadcast at home. Um, there may be people that have been believers for some time and maybe you've believed for years. But you've been nervous or shy to be baptized in front of people and, and you've never actually gone through with it. And the longer you haven't been baptized, the harder it is. Because you feel like, oh, I should have done this years ago. And you feel kind of ashamed or something like that or afraid. Well, I would encourage you to think very, very uh, heavily about um, stepping into the waters of baptism. Um, we're going to be having a baptism service sometime in the next uh, month or so. I haven't quite decided on the date. But, um, yeah, if you do want to get baptized... Uh, I would encourage you to come see me um, sometime during the week. Give me a call, and we can sit down and talk. Um, but uh, this being the case, baptism is important. It's really important. And I, I thought it might be beneficial this morning, since we're looking at this down the road here, um, to talk about baptism and what it was in the past and what it is today and what it means now. It's good for us to consider the different meanings of baptism because there's some very deep truths that come along with baptism and the teaching of baptism. And it's an important step of faith for each true believer in Jesus Christ to take. So I want to spend some time with you this morning exploring baptism. I'd like to talk about what it is, the history of where it came from, what it is, and what it isn't today. So I hope and pray that you'll grow in your understanding as we explore the scriptures together. So we're going to be digging deep into the Word of God this morning. Um, but let's talk first of all about uh, where baptism came from. Let's talk about the history of baptism and where the ceremony came from. So as I was preparing for this message, I did some research into this topic. And uh, I actually looked at it a little deeper and differently than I've ever looked at it before, and I've came to some conclusions um, based upon history. Now, there's some skeptics out there that are uh, skeptics of Christianity, saying that baptism predated Christianity and it actually originated in some pagan traditions. Well, although there were ceremonies in some ancient pagan religions around purification by cleansing with water, um, upon close observation, there doesn't seem to be any ties to the Christian ceremony of baptism. So that's, there is just no evidence whatsoever that there's any ties. So, where did baptism come from? In the Mosaic Law of the Old Testament Scriptures, as outlined in the book of Leviticus, we find that there were specific laws in the Law of Moses of ceremonial purification that were established for the Israelites. And these ceremonies um, were basically when someone touched something or someone considered to be unclean or had been physically contaminated by a bodily discharge of any kind, they had to go, according to the law of Moses, had to go through a ceremony of cleansing. And this ceremony, part of it, Okay? included being fully immersed in a ritual bath, or what the Hebrews called the mikvah, before they were able to go to the temple or tabernacle to present sacrifices to God for the forgiveness of their sins. So, ceremonially, they had to go through this purification, baptism, or dunking in the mikvah, to be ceremonial clean before coming into the tabernacle 
or temple to prevent sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins, or for the covering of their sins, I should say. Now, God told Moses in Leviticus chapter 15, 31, he said, this is how you will guard the people of Israel from ceremonial uncleanliness. Otherwise, they would die, for their impurity would defile my tabernacle that stands among them. And in context, this is talking about an immersion in the mikvah before going to the tabernacle or the temple. So just like the person who touches something unclean that came out of them, people had to be baptized in the mikvah repetitively every time they became ceremonially unclean. Just as it, just in the same way, as every time there was sin that needed to be uh, sacrificed for, covered over, in the old covenant, you had to do this over and over and over again. So you were constantly bringing sacrifices. You're constantly going into the mikvah and being immersed in water ceremonially to become clean and constantly going to the priest to offer sacrifices to God to cover over your sins. And that was a temporary covering. This was such a serious ceremony in ancient Israel. I read that uh, archaeologists in the modern day have uncovered at approximately 700 ritual mikvahs in modern day Israel that were done in ancient times, that were used in ancient times. Approximately 200 have been discovered in Jerusalem alone, and 50 of those mikvahs are surrounding the Temple Mount. So the washing of water to cleanse physically was a ceremony designed to spiritually indicate that a person was willing to submit themselves to being washed of their impurities by God in a spiritual way at the temple through the blood sacrifice of animals. And those animals were offered as sacrifices on the altar in the temple or the tabernacle. For God had decreed from the beginning that the penalty of sin is death. So the price for the forgiveness of sins must be the shedding of blood because the life of a physical being is in its blood. It's been written in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, 19 to 22. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. And then he said, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So it was significant that John the Baptist was baptizing people in the waters of the Jordan River as a ritual mikvah to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, the sacrificial Lamb of God who would cleanse anyone in the world from their sins who placed their trust in him through the shedding of his own blood on the cross for their forgiveness. Do you see the connection? So we see in John chapter 1, the Pharisees who are the religious leaders of the day questioning John as to why he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And, and, and they're asking Jesus about his identity. And in the course of this, we read in John chapter 1, starting with verse 22. Then who are you? This is the Pharisee speaking. We need an answer for those who sent us. What have you said to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah. I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, If you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water. But right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany, an area east of the Jordan River, where John was baptizing. 
The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. So John, what he was saying, what he was telling the people in this scripture is that he was not the Messiah. He was the one who ritually prepared people through washing in a mikvah to be introduced to the Messiah, the Savior. The Savior he was ritually preparing the people to be introduced to would be the sacrificial lamb of God for the sins of the entire world. You see, those who were coming to John to be baptized desired to turn away from their life of sin in repentance. They were coming to John to be richly prepared in a mikvah, a ceremonial bath, to have their sins washed away by God's Passover lamb who would be giving his life for their transgressions. For the blood sacrifice offered by the one lamb of God would be enough not just to cover temporarily over impurities of one person for one occasion. But the sacrifice offered by the Lamb of God would be sufficient to take away the sin of every single human being in the world who had placed their trust in a sacrificial offering once and for all time in completeness. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, we are told, it was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor, Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Eteria and Transconitus. Lysanus was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At the time, a message from God, at this time, sorry, at this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching the people to the pe- that the people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken to John when he said, a, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled, and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened, and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. You see, my friends, long ago through ancient prophecies, people were told about the coming of a Savior into this world. That Savior would be none less than God himself, the glorious king of the universe, born in human flesh by a virgin. That Savior would be born into a world in the town of Bethlehem, and the importance of this coming king would be monumental. It was so important that God spoke through his prophet Malachi in Malachi 3.1, predicting that someone would come ahead of this king, of the Messiah, to herald his arrival. The prophet Malachi broadcast God's prediction saying, Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The fulfillment of this prophecy came when John the Baptist was sent to Israel to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that the Apostle John wrote about John the Baptist in the Bible. In, book, in the book of John, chapter 1, 6 to 9, we read, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one true who is the true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So people who came to understand their brokenness and that their sin was separating them from God came to John to be baptized him, 
by him in the mikvah, the ceremonial bath of the Jordan. They came because they realized that they were unclean and they needed forgiveness and they wanted to repent of their sins. Jordan River, they came down there. They came, I don't know how many, doesn't say, but it was creating quite a stir in the ancient land, such a stir that the Pharisees were sent there to see what was going on. They were afraid because everyone considered John to be a prophet, and indeed he was. As they came to be baptized in the Jordan River, John the Baptist told the people, as recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 11, saying about the coming Savior, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not worthy to be a slave or to carry his sandals. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And when Jesus came to the river to be baptized by John, it is recorded in Matthew 3.13, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. He said, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said it should be done, for we must carry out all, of God's requi- all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. And after his baptiz- baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and sendle- settling upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. <laughs> See, we need to understand that the Lord of creation came as an example to all of us to follow. Jesus let John baptize him, not because he sinned or needed to repent. John the Baptist understood that it was he should be, who should be baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. He knew that Jesus was God, the Son, and that Jesus was the creator of the universe. Jesus permitted John to baptize him to signal the start of his earthly ministry. He wanted to show everyone, including all future generations, including us here today, an example of submission and obedience to God the Father's will, that God the Father desires all follow in obedience, and that all people who would believe in him should follow his example by submitting to one of the things that the Heavenly Father willed, and that was to be baptized. I'm going to get into it a little bit more here because you're probably wondering, is that the same baptism as what we have now? What's going on here? We're going to get to that. No, it's not. But Jesus lived a sinless life. He showed people what God was like as a human being. He didn't just come to show us what God was like, though. He came to die on the cross for our sins as our blood sacrifice, to die instead of us. The Bible tells us that God loved the world and that he did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world from what? From their sins. God is in the business of saving people from their sins. He's, I've mentioned this before. Not only from uh, the, the penalty of our sins, but also from the power of our sins. That's what God came to do. That's what Jesus came for. Because of sin, all people are sentenced to death and separation from God. But God did not leave us to die as sinners. He loved us so much that he gave Jesus as a gift. Jesus came into the world to die on a cross for us. He did this to give his children the gift of life in exchange for the death penalty hanging over them. And after Jesus he died, he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he came back to life. Death couldn't keep him down. He was raised from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. He was taken to heaven in newness of life where he is now preparing a place for those who love him and are saved for all of eternity. Now, if we believe him and what he says, and we turn away from our life of sin, then his blood sacrifice will be applied to us and our sins will will be forgiven. And we talked about this last week. 
that how faith doesn't always mean that it is saving faith. Saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is always, always, always accompanied by repentance. It is never separated from that. Because without works, faith is dead. As a matter of fact, it is demonic because the demons believe and tremble because they know what's coming. And they believe a lot more than a lot of people. Saving faith. So Jesus died for sin. And whoever places their trust in on him, their sin is transferred onto the Savior, and their sins are washed away from their spirit, and they are as white as snow, cleansed by the grace of God. He didn't have to do it, but he did it because of love, because there was no other way. There's no other way to God except through Jesus Christ for you to to be freed from your sins and to be set free to worship your Creator. There is only one way to your creator God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ came as a sacrifice and died so that you wouldn't have to. That is the beauty of the gospel. Isn't that terrific news? We're raised. When we ask Jesus to be our Savior, when we submit our hearts to him, he cleans us out, and then he puts his spirit within us, the Holy Spirit. We're raised to a new spiritual life here which will continue in our present bodies until we pass away or we're raptured. But it resonates and it takes, it it continues into eternity. So salvation is, is just the starting point. It's the starting point for an everlasting life relationship with our creator, with God, through Jesus This is the gift that Jesus suffered to give us. He's the one who was the creator of all things. Everything that has been created was created by Jesus. And yet this creator saw us in our desperation and gave himself as a sacrifice when he didn't have to so that we could live. And you know what Jesus told his disciples just before rising into heaven? The book of Matthew tells us that he told his disciples that he wanted them to listen to him. He wanted them to obey and listen to him. Because God loves the people of the world so much, Jesus wanted his disciples to take the same message of love and forgiveness they had received from him to other people in the world too so that many more people could be saved by the gospel message just like they had been saved. In Matthew 11, 18 to 20, we're told this. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples, and this is the caveat, Teach these new disciples to obey all of the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Baptism and obedience. Baptism and repentance are inseparable. You can't have one with the other. Just like you can't have faith without works. Baptism is not baptism unless it's accompanied by repentance. Because salvation does not come until repentance comes. Baptism cannot be coming until repentance comes. See, John the Baptist was telling the people to repent of their sins and make their hearts ready in advance of the coming of Jesus who would be their sacrificial lamb. And and through this sacrificial lamb, a new covenant would be coming which we brought into effect through the shedding of the Lamb of God's blood. This would be the new covenant that would come into effect. But here, just, as, just before Jesus rises into heaven, he calls his followers to teach other people to believe and obey all of his commandments that he would give them to follow. And how do we obey? 
Why do we obey? Because of love. Because we love him. Because he's filled our hearts with his goodness. And the spirit of God fills us with a heart of love for him. And that heart desires to please him and to have a relationship with him. And the heart that wants to please God runs away from sin. It does. If you love God, you will not sin. That's what Jesus said. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Why? Because your heart has been changed. The spirit of the Lord comes inside of your heart. And it is this, the spirit of the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord, because he is holy. And it's not saying that we're perfect. But we have to be willing to turn away from the old life and to walk new. When we mess up, we mess up. We ask God forgiveness and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And we draw close to God again when we repent of our sins in the midst of this. And God draws us close. But the heart of God longs for holiness in his people. So John... John was asking people to come and prepare their hearts to be cleansed by the Lamb of God. It was a baptism of repentance where they would be cut to the heart and willing to say, I want your salvation, God, and I'm so sorry because I'm a sinner and I need you. That's the heart of the people coming to John on the cusp of the Lamb of God. Just like the ceremonial mikvah, people were told if you're Ceremony unclean for touching something unclean or being unclean of any, having uncleanliness in your physical body. You need to rinse in the mitzvah in honor of the Lord before you bring sacrifices to him. See, that's how it started. But now, now Jesus had been raised to life. He had overcome sin in the grave. He was only in the grave for three days and he rose again. He's a risen Lord, and just before he ascended into heaven, he tells us to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit those who have repented of their sins and have said, I have decided to follow Jesus because he has called me, and I have surrendered. I want to follow him in obedience because I love him. Because I love him. So let's follow him into the waters of baptism because now baptism takes on a whole new a new ceremony. See, the law was fulfilled in Christ. The law, we don't have to go to the mikvah multiple times anymore to be ceremonially cleansed as the law of Moses suggested. And it's not like that anymore. Now under the new covenant, those who turn away from their life of sin and repentance and faith ask Jesus to apply his sacrificial life offering to their lives. Lord, would you save me? Would you apply your sacrifice to my life and wash me clean by the blood sacrifice that you gave as the Lamb of God? Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, as it washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. I am set free. I'm new. Thank you, Lord, for having mercy upon me, a sinner who was saved not by something I did, but because of your goodness and your grace. And I trust in you, Lord, because you are good. This is the new covenant in his blood. Now that Jesus has paid the price for the sin, the old covenant or the law of Moses has been fulfilled and a new covenant has been established. We no longer go into the mikvah bath as a ceremony to prepare us for blood sacrifice offered on our behalf. Now under the new covenant, those who turn away from their life of sin in repentance and in faith ask Jesus to apply his sacrificial offering to their lives and they are washed clean by the blood of Jesus' sacrifice once and for all. Complete. It's finished. Done. Don't have to keep going back. The blood has been shed for you. So when you come to the Lord and he saves you, he's made you his new person. You are one new man or woman in him. In the new covenant, those who are cleansed by Jesus are cleansed by his grace through faith, through God's grace through faith. And now a new covenant has happened. And now there's a new baptism ceremony that has been established by God. This was established by Jesus. He was the one before he just rose into heaven. He said, baptize. This is a new covenant baptism. Those who have been saved under the new covenant are now commanded 
to walk into the waters of baptism in a new believer, baptism. The new covenant of grace replaces the old covenant. And this is why it's so important for us to understand what baptism was, what baptism is right now. Jesus is the mediator of our covenant, and he's the one who asks us to follow him into the waters of baptism once we believe. He taught his disciples from the beginning to do this. Do you know why? Why would he do this? It is an outward expression, a public expression of an inward change that has occurred by the grace of God, the cleansing power of the Lamb of God. And it's a spiritual ceremony. It's a ceremony that we recognize how we are saved and why we are saved and what happens when we are saved. We recognize that before the receiving of Jesus as our sacrifice, we were defiled and in need of spiritual cleansing. God called us to believe that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. We are then called to approach God with a heart that's willing to repent of our sins, to turn away from our life of sin and to follow him. When Jesus called the people, he said, follow me, follow me. This is a life of repentance. A person that is not willing to repent of their sins is not a believer, period. This is why many on that day will say, Lord, didn't we do this, that, and the other thing in your name? And he said, I did not know you. Why? Because God wants all of us. He wants all of us. All to Jesus, I surrender. Can you surrender God all to Jesus on your own strength? No way, not a chance. But God gives you the power to become the sons and daughters of God. He gives you the overcoming power to let go of the old ways and to come into new relationship with him. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is redeeming power in the light love of blood of Jesus. There is resurrection power in the blood of Jesus. So this is why when we go to baptism, okay, a person cannot be properly baptized unless they're willing to repent. An infant baptism by the way, is not true baptism. It's more like a baby dedication. Because there's no a true believer's baptism must be preceded by repentance. Baptism provided, provides an opportunity to identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to new life. See? When a person submits to being dunked under the waters of baptism, the water represents a grave in the new believer's baptism. It represents a grave. When we're submerged under the water, it is a signal that we are submitting to God to dip us below his cleansing flood, to wash us clean, to bury our sinful nature just as Christ was placed in the tomb. We go to die. When we baptize, we're saying, I surrender all to you, Lord. I surrender. I give my life to you. Dunk me, Lord. Wash me clean. Bury my old nature in the waters of baptism. And when you come up out of the waters of baptism, you come out a new creation in Christ, alive in him, born again in the spirit, forgiven of your sins, given new life. The spirit of God has created this ceremony as a public declaration by people. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is the son of God, and you confess him with your mouth, what? You will be saved. This is a step of confession, of true repentance, saying, I will follow Jesus. Where he calls me, I will follow. Now, we understand that there's justification and then there's sanctification. We talked about that last week too, right? I'm not worthy. No, you're not. Guess what? None of us are. We're not worthy, but God calls us nonetheless. Come as you are. Repent. You're going to make mistakes along the way. Everyone does. So don't let that hold you back. But your heart must be turned to God, and you have to be willing to let go of the old man or the old lady and all the sin that's associated with it. You've got to be willing to let it go. Otherwise, 
This has no effect. This is a step of obedience. It's an outward expression of an inward change. Folks, this is repentance according to Scripture. We need to be willing to walk away from our old ways and follow Jesus. The old sinful nature is symbolically buried with Christ in the watery grave. Our spirit is washed clean from all iniquity and we're brought back to life in newness and filled with the Spirit, given with the Holy Spirit. Now that the heart's clean, it's washed clean, we come up to new life. Oh, our spiritual nature is now raised with Christ. Ah. Apostle Paul says in Colossians 2.12, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Jesus said in Mark 16.6, Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. And on this day of Pentecost, if you remember, the early church exploded in population because the Holy Spirit baptized the believers. And they preached the gospel. And people were cut to the heart by the Spirit's call, and they repented of their sins. They were cut to the heart, it says, and they repented. And in that day, 3,000 were added to their number, and they baptized them. What a glorious start to the church. And this continues on today. So, it continues on in 100 Mile House, British Columbia, Canada, in this little town, in our little assembly. It continues. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, I would ask you today, if you've never understood or believed in Jesus, you can come to know him today. If you're listening online here, ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Be willing to turn away and cast away all you're missing is a heartache, dear friend. A disillusionment for a keepsake. If you hold on to a life of sin, it's just going to destroy you in the end. Let go of your sin. Come to Jesus. Come to the Lord today. Be cleansed from your sin. All you have to do is believe and be willing to follow the Lord Jesus. And he will clean you and he'll deposit his Holy Spirit inside of you. It's, a, it's that simple. But yet, it is so profound. You must put your trust in him. Acknowledge that you're a sinner. Ask him to be your savior. And then, be baptized. Be baptized in front of all of the family of God. They're your accountability partners as you walk through life. They're the ones that you march side by side with. Jesus is calling If you've submitted your life to Jesus Christ and you've turned your, li turned your back on your old ways and said, I don't want that anymore, I want to follow you. I don't know what that means. And I don't even know how I'm going to overcome the patterns of my life as they've been set. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm willing to let it go. I'm willing to follow you, Jesus, wherever you lead me. Then the Spirit of God will give you the power to overcome. And you can come to baptism and be baptized. Maybe some here have been baptized and they never understood what was going on. It was all only just some ceremony that dad said I should do or mom said I should do or the pope said I should do or the priest said I should do or whoever said I should do because it's the right thing to do. Now you understand. If you understand, come to be baptized and give testimony to the other believers that you, as for you and your house, you will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. And I'll just ask the music team to come forward. Jesus, we thank you for baptism. We thank you for the word. We thank you for all this truth.
God, there's just so much more even that we could glean as we study your word. But Lord, for the nuggets that we've got this morning, God, we praise you. We thank you for the fact that you came, Lord, that you, you atoned for our sins. You died instead of us so that we could place our trust in you and you cleanse us, God. You bury us in the waters of baptism, Lord, and, and we're cleansed. Father, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Our old man, our old lady is now buried. I'm a new creation in you. Father, help me to walk in such a way that is pleasing to you. Help me to be obedient and to live a life of love that pleases you. Pray for each person here today as they go their separate ways. Bless them. May your grace and peace rest on them. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you um, need to pray, the, I would just encourage you to come forward and pray. I don't know what it is maybe that's hanging you up, that's hurting you, but God knows. Come and pray. And if you need prayer, you can come ask someone that will be up here uh, to pray with you. Amen.